Thank you, Cynthia. Um, yes, so I'm Dee Doherty. I'm the Deputy Grants Management Officer. And as of today, I'm the Acting Chief Grants Management, Management Officer for NIDDK. So um, I will lead you through a conversation. Um, and then Dr. John Connaughton will be our next. John, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm John Connaughton. I'm the Chief of the scientific review branch at the NIDDK. Um, uh, thank you for joining this conference. Tracy? Hi, everybody. It's great to see um, the representation flying in the chat. Um, Tracy Rankin, I am a program director within the division um, of kidney, urologic, and hematologic diseases within NIDDK. And Natasha? Hi, I'm Natasha Loveless, and I am a Senior Grants Management Specialist um, at EDK. So this presentation is, where do I turn when I need help or advice from the NIH? So what everyone needs to understand is that we all work together, program, review, grants management, grants management talks to review about um, if a, about the funding opportunity announcements program actually starts the funding opportunity announcements out. They speak to review. There's a lot of people that are involved in the actual process. And today we're just going to introduce you to each one of those areas so that you can get, gain an understanding of what each one of them does. So the first area that we're going to dis, that we're going to explore is the review branch. So John. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to go through the roles, some of the roles of the scientific review officer uh, at the NIH. Um, so the, the S scientific review officer or SRO recruits reviewers and assigns applications to those reviewers for peer review. We manage uh, the overall uh, execution of the grant review meeting as well as managing conflicts of interest um, uh, during the meeting and actually before the meeting. We prepare summary statements, which uh, is the key definitive outcome of peer review for your application. Uh, the face page of that document will have the score um, uh, and in some cases percentile. And we provide that information to, to, um, to the NIH uh, institutes and centers. Um, the, the NIH does split um, peer review into two domains. One is uh, the Center for Scientific Review that review the bulk of the rev um, application uh, investigator initiated R01 grants submitted to the NIH. The ICs or the institutes and centers like NIDDK review applications um, primarily uh, submitted to funding opportunity announcements issued by NIDDK. Okay, so before you submit your application, I think the one thing that I want to stress, and you may have heard um, earlier, but I'll say it again, is I strongly recommend that you reach out to a program director before you submit or think about submitting an application to the NIH uh, for possible funding. Uh, they'll be able to address issues of, is my science appropriate for this funding opportunity announcement? Does it fit within the scientific mission of your uh, institute? Um, and that will uh, really help you uh, avoid wasting a bit of time um, <laughs> preparing an application that doesn't quite fit. Um, the scientific review officer, okay, so where are we found? In, in the bottom of every funding opportunity announcement, there's a section seven agency contacts. There'll be a peer review contact, there'll be a scientific contact, i.e. the program director. There'll also be a grants management staff person assigned um, uh, to that FOA as well. After you submitted your application, your scientific review office will, will ultimately um, have applications assigned to him or her for review. Um, uh, 
This information can be found in the ERA Commons uh, when you log in. And uh, once the application is in, um, post-submission materials are allowed up to 30 days before the review meeting, and there's NIH policy governing what can and cannot be submitted um, post-review. Uh, applications are indeed expected to be complete up, upon submission. So after the review meeting, the, the SRO will uh, complete the summary statement. Um, scores uh, will be released generally within 48 hours of the meeting. Summary statements can take, you know, four to six weeks, um, de depending on the workload of the SRO. Um, prior to getting your summary statement, I suggest that you not contact your program director. Um, uh, they would be a contact after the review meeting. Uh, if you contact me as an SRO, um, your first question is, am I going to be funded? And um, the SRO will have absolutely no idea. So uh, wait till you get your summary statement. Your program director will be uh, um, indicated on that document and um, uh, they can be very helpful. Reach out to them, schedule a, uh, uh, a call and um, you can go over your results. Okay, so... Um, uh, how are you going to find an SRO? Well, um, first of all, you can um, go to the Center for Scientific Review Study Sections. They'll be listed there. Um, uh, the CSR has a um, referral tool for directing your application to various study sections based on the science contained within the application. Um, and study section rosters are, of course, published um, uh, by the NIH. Uh, do not think about contacting a reviewer that's listed on a standing or special emphasis panel. Um, uh, applicants uh, cannot contact reviewers. Um, so I think with that, um, uh, I will turn, turn uh, over to um, uh, the presentation to Dr. Tracy Rankin. So, John, Hi, there, John, there were a couple of questions in the Q and A for okay. you. Um, one of them is: Are the additional docs specifically the multi PI management plan peer? Is it peer reviewed? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, that is part of uh, the standard review criteria. So that if you have a multi PI application, the multi-PI leadership plan will be evaluated by the reviewers. Right. And the second question is, what would be, what would the reason be for contacting your SRO when your grant is under review? So prior to the review meeting, if you're not sure that the application is the best fit for the um, review panel, that's going to evaluate the application. And this would be for uh, R01 investigator initiated grants submitted to the parent program announcement and reviewed at CSR. You can contact um, the SRO and um, uh, discuss whether or not the application is being reviewed by the right uh, committee um, for uh, for applications that come in for IC review um, uh, to an IC issued funding opportunity announcement, your, your application will be in the right meeting. Um, uh, but you know that would be another reason if you have questions uh, about how the applications are being reviewed, um, you can certainly reach out to the SRO. Thank you. Okay. Yep. There you go, Dr. Rankin. Got it. Um, so, uh, Daron, do you did you launch the poll? I mean, now everyone's had like this whole time to think about the answer to this question. It's not very oh. hard. Um, but yeah, please go in and and address the question, or just give people a few minutes 
to uh, answer yes or no, and we'll we'll see where folks stand. Um, and then we'll go. Ah, interesting. So uh, a, a significant proportion say yes, and that's excellent. Um, but then a not too insignificant portion say no. So hopefully we can provide a little bit more information about what we do here in program, how we fit in the larger scheme of things, and how you can find out who your program officer could be um, with some of the resources we have available here at NIH. So uh, we can move the next slide. Ah, sorry. Here we go. So program is probably the more most amorphous role here at NIH in the sense that um, it's clear scientific review officers, they're gonna manage the review, you're here from grants management, they're all about the money and making sure nobody goes to jail and spending the money. Program is in this space sort of in between where we can help you before you submit an application, as Dr. Connaughton indicated, in terms of determining the best scientific home here at NIH, we have 27 different institutes and centers. They cover the breadth of science and disease entities um, that affect the public um, across the world. And each one of those institutes has a specific mission. And your science will undoubtedly fit into one of those institutes. And our job here in program is to help you find that best scientific home, to find the best pathway for your particular project. Is it a clinical project? Is it more of a basic science project? Is it really not fitting into any of these easy buckets? Are there special opportunities for my work that are out there that I can consider for applying for support? Um, we can also help with this the sticky wickets of navigating the application process. You know, we do attend peer review strictly as observers, and there are subsequent sessions in the NIH regional conference here that you're attending that, that really dive into the nitty gritties of, of peer review and what happens during a peer review meeting. So I would encourage you all to attend the mock study section next, I think that's tomorrow. Um, but we're there as observers in the study sections where our applications assigned to us are reviewed. Now, each program officer at NIH has what we call a portfolio of applications and awards germane to the scientific expertise of that individual. Uh, in my case, I have a R portfolio of R01s that's focused on urologic aspects of, um, of disease in the prostate and bladder, but I also have career development applications and awards in my portfolio, but we, we've sort of, a lot of the, the portfolios are divided along these lines of science. And we attend study sections where our applications are reviewed strictly as observers to listen, listen to the discussion, listen to um, the entire review of the applications in our domain. Now, as Dr. Connaughton indicated, well, once you hit submit on an application, you don't call me as a program officer for anything related to the application. That, that's really, I'm just going to redirect you to the, the scientific review officer. If you have additional materials or if you have questions about the review process, that's not my domain. However, <laughs> as soon as your review is completed and you get a score, then absolutely feel free to contact me, reach out um, to talk about the next steps. These are actually outlined in the summary statements. Um, in terms of what happens next after the review, after you receive a score, because now it's all going to be about, well, what does the score mean? What does this mean in terms of receiving support? Is this something I really have to, you know, is this an application I have to revise and resubmit if, I, if I'm going to be competitive for support? So that's the next phase of interaction with program officers. And if you are fortunate enough to get an award, we are going to be friends for the duration of that award, so to speak. You are going to be updating me on the progress every year for in the terms of your progress reports, for how you're going on your project, how, what progress you're making, what are your findings. And we, you know, you will certainly stay in touch as the award comes to a close to talk about whether this is something you should renew as a competitive renewal project 
or if there are additional opportunities um, in making sure that the award close out if you decide not to pursue a renewal or a new award um, is conducted uh, as it should be in terms of policy. But we, we will be monitoring your progress, making sure you're compliant with all the policies that apply to your particular award. And also uh, what we really like to do is talk to you about your science and how the project's going and the results you're getting. So I think that, um, it brings us to the when. I think I've already touched on this when we were talking about the circle. Before you submit, absolutely call a program officer, make contact with a program officer to talk about your project and the right fit for their particular portfolio and institute. We can also talk about some of these, again, application logistics, particularly if you have a big project in mind. There are policies and procedures you need to step through to make sure we accept that application. And then after our, the summary statement, a part, lot, large part of my day is spent with individuals after they receive their summary statement to do sort of a post-mortem on the review and things they might wanna consider in terms of next steps, revise, resubmit, prospects for funding, timeline for such a decision. And I've already touched on what happens during the award. Um, everything, you know, we, we hope goes perfectly, but stuff happens. You know, I, it, I find it interesting. Natural disasters is here at the top of the list. Um, those used to be rare. Now, not so. Um, but if such an incident would recall you in the middle of an award period, certainly program officers can be quite integral to helping you find resources to recover from such a uh, an incident in terms of disruption to your research program. You know, most recently, COVID was huge, huge disruption to the research enterprise and program officers were integral in trying to help uh, awardees and applicants navigate those disruptions. And I think that is it. Brief synopsis of what POs do. I will turn it over back over to Dee and her team um, to talk about what grants management does. And Dr. Rankin, we do have several questions in the chat for, for you. Um, I think we can just kind of summarize some of them, but one of them is POs are often very busy and don't have time to chat <laughs> and don't respond to emails. Oh, yeah. What do we do when we need help prior to submission, but POs are unresponsive? Ah. Um, I've actually gotten <laughs> this question a lot. They, first, you guys aren't talking to me. So I will, you know, put a plug in for my colleagues here in DK and uh, in my division, particularly. Um, yeah, we've got a lot going on for sure. Um, but be or bear in mind, everybody has a supervisor. Right. You know, if you have done due diligence, you have reached out by email, you've left voicemails, you've done all of the, you know, the um, the steps that we've advised you to take to make contact with a PO and you're not getting anywhere. Sometimes just a quick ping to that person's supervisor. I mean, the organizational structure of every institute is, is on each institute's website can often get folks to move. Um, sometimes it is a matter of timing. I always say the best time to try and reach out to us is when things tend to be a little slower, which is the fall. September, October, the best submission dates I tell people are the October and November ones. One, because you know our budget year closes the end of September. So systems are down, we're not making awards. There's not a whole lot of activity going on in terms of uh, reviewing progress reports and getting awards out. And it's a good time to try and make contact with a program officer. Another good place is at scientific meetings. Um, please, you know, look at who's going to these large scientific meetings. I attend the society meetings relevant to my portfolio. My colleagues do as well. Those are great places to make the face-to-face -face contact with the program officer. Many societies have, you know, sort of a meet the program officer session. Um, but do not give up. And, um, you know, again, don't, don't take the unresponsiveness is that we're not interested in your science. Just make sure you can find, you know, their supervisor and get them, get them, get your email back to the top of the, uh, the top of the inbox. 
So there's a couple of other sentence, other questions, but I think some of this we can come back to, but there's one more I really want to ask you. Is it appropriate to contact several POs to explore the fit of the pro proposal with the IC mission and strategic plans? Absolutely. There are some areas of science that cross mission interests. Um, you know, in my world, a lot of it has to do with hypertension. Hypertension is a complex process. There's some, some aspects of hypertension regulation are found that are kidney specific, we would support. Other aspects would be supported by the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, for instance. And it is absolutely appropriate to reach out to several program officers, if the, if the uh, topic is quite broad, to gauge their interest and fit. Um, you know, again, our goal is to find the best scientific home for you. So you, you want to find a place that is interested in your science, but also once there's an award that can really work with you to promote your science and um, ensure that you, you have, you know, scientific continuity going forward. Right. Okay, so we will come back to questions. Um, I don't think grants management will take too awful long. So, I'm gonna go ahead with grants management to kick it off. Um, what is grants management? We make the award, we manage the grant award after it's been awarded. Um, the grants management, the chief grants management officer of each institute is really the only official at NIH that can obligate the funds for an award. <clears throat> so let's talk about there's two different kinds of grants management officials. There's the chief grants management officer, which the chief is the boss of the office. Um, that boss will then um, delegate authority to the specialists, which the specialists are the people that, I mean, they're the ones who do the work. They're the ones who, who actually get all the documents together. So the grants management officer, the, the chief, is the authorized personnel that delegates authority to the grants management specialist. That's the first responsibility. Second responsibility is it's the chief grants management officer that has to ensure and make sure that all um, business management requirements for each institute is adhered to. So we're like the policy policeman. Um, and I hate to say that, but that's kind of what we are. Um, we assist in the evaluation of applications um, for administrative content if there is any kind of issues and the grant specialists need to actually have a policy interpreted for them. Um, we monitor the grants administrative and fiscal aspects. We talk to the budget office a lot. Um, we are involved in decisions when measures need to be taken in order to protect the public interest um, we assure compliance with the federal laws and NIH administrative policies and procedures. Um, and then, um, like I said, the chief grants management officer is the NIH official authorized to obligate the NIH to the expenditure of funds or to change funding amounts, budget project period dates, or other terms and conditions of the grant award. So, a lot of people don't understand what the grants management officer is versus the grants management specialist. And so there you have it. The grants management officer is the boss of the office. We, we, we're the bossy ones. We're the ones that tell everybody what to do. And then the specialists will take over with what we want them to do. So I'm gonna let Natasha tell you all about her job and what she does and how she helps me to ensure that we do everything right. Thank you, Dee. <laughs> so yes, um, as a grant management specialist, um, we have been given authorization to um, release the, the awards. So we are kind of the last people to see your award and we push it out the door. Um, so we assure that, the, that they are compliant with the federal laws and the NIH policy. And we're analyzing your grants prior to the awards. So we're making sure that everything is okay with your, um, your application. Um, if there are anything missing, you will receive an email from us um, to get that information. 
Um, we prepared the award for release um, by preparing all the budgets and official file documentation that is needed. So we're going through your budget and making sure that um, your line items are allowable according to the grants policy. Um, and then if there are any cuts, we are making those cuts on your, on your budget. And then again, anything that is um, needed in the just-in-time, what have you, we are putting in an official file. We also um, provide technical assistance, interpret um, NIH policy and institute procedures. Um, if you're having any issues with uploading or um, just any problems, um, we, you can email us and we will try to help you with that. Um, for the, the um, for the uh, grants management specialist, sorry, um, when, when to contact um, the grant specialist. Um, so just like Dr. Rankin said that our, the grants man management specialist, we also have portfolios. And so therefore we are, um, we have a specific grants. And so we are able to, to work on your grant. So when you're contacting, you have questions, um, we have intimate knowledge about that because for, for the most part, we're staying with your grant year to year. Sometimes it changes and you know, we'll let you know that, but um, we have that information um, to let you know. Um, so when to contact us. So um, for your board request, um, it's our just in time. And that's when we asked for um, your other support, IRB approvals, uh, FMA, what have you, um, answers to um, summary statements. Um, a lot of times you will receive an automated email um, way ahead of when we uh, contact you. And usually when we contact you, we're giving you more um, a, of a detailed request. Um, so it'll be more um, tailored to your particular brand. Um, also, if there's any delays in your paperwork, um, there's a lot of different deadlines that um, you have to meet. And if there's something going on, um, just let us know. Just email us um, that this is what's happening so we can know. Um, and then to uh, discuss financial and grant administration issues, any budget questions. Um, a lot of times when you receive that notice of award and you start reading through and you may see cuts or what have you, then you may have questions about um, your budget. So just email us. Um, if you're adding a foreign component, it's very important that you let us know that ahead of time um, because a lot of times those things require um, State Department clearance. So we really will need that information to help you um, get any paperwork that needs to um, continue that, that work. Um, questions about the budget, budget or other support, like I said, um, I really encourage that when you receive your notice of award to read through the whole thing. Um, there's so much information on there and things are specific to your grants. So you'll see a term, there might be a special term in there that you need to report or something to send back, but you just wanna make sure that you go through that and then you'll be able to see, okay, this is what I need to do for this year and the years coming. Um, if there's any clarification or questions about um, the policy or something that you may um, be curious about or you disagree with, you know, you can always, again, um, email us because we, you know, are interpreting that policy um, to, to your, to your grants. So, um, Another reason to, to contact grants management is prior approvals. And these are approvals that are needed from NIH um, before you continue an, a particular action. So um, a lot of times you can see in the, the grants policy statement that there's a list of all of the various um, prior approvals and you'll need to send that um, to us. So uh, common ones are change of scope, um, reducing 
PI effort by 25% or more. Going from a single PI to a multi-PI. Multi um, also, if you are transferring to a new institution, um, we really need to know these things ahead of time so that there won't be any delays in your award. Um, and sometimes certain actions may take more time than others. Um, also, if you have a carryover of unobligated funds from a previous budget period to a subsequent budget period, uh, this doesn't occur for all grants, um, but some grants like civil grants and clinical trials, you may need uh, prior approval before you're able to use those funds. Okay. Um, and I, I also want to um, stress that when you are sending us information for the official um, file, that we need that from the signing official. Um, oftentimes, we are talking to PIs or um, programs talking to PIs and they email information, but, and then we might have to turn around and say, thank you, you know, but we have to get um, a concurrence or information from the uh, business official. And the reason why is because we have to put in the official file. So, um, and then lastly, if there are questions that your business office is um, not sure of, or they have a question, you can always um, email us and we will try to answer as best as possible. But if not, we will direct you direct you to the proper person. Thank you, and I'll send it back over to Dee. Thank you, Natasha. So mm -hmm. the last few slides um, on here are just general websites, helpful websites that you can go out and you can look up um, things on, like there's the coronavirus 2019 information um, out there. Um, information on electronic submissions, just going through a, a few of these, all about grants podcast. OER puts out an awful lot of helpful information. Um, who can apply for funding? So you can you can continue. I mean, these last few slides are just that. They're just nothing but additional resources. I want to be sure to give us enough time to actually answer some live questions. Um, and then, yes, we talk in federal speak. There's a lot of acronyms out there. NOAA's and OPERA and CSR and RPGs. And if you just don't understand exactly what we're talking about, all you need to do is ask us. Um, I started my career out in the grantee institutions. Um, and so I understand that there's, we all speak a different language. And so at my institute, a lot of times people pull on my knowledge from the grant from the grantee organizations in order to be able to make sure that they're speaking the right language to you. So if you if you have questions, um, you always can pick up the phone for one of the NIH officers and um, ask them the question. Ask them, you know, how do we do something? So I wanted to give that that time back. We do have a lot of questions in. Um, the Q&A, we probably won't have a whole lot of time to go back through those, but we can take a look at what was actually recorded and we can send responses at a later time also. But right now, I'd like to turn it over for questions. There is a lot going on in the in the Q and A. I'm I'm trying to type some answers as I go. Um, Hi, this is Cynthia. So I, there were a couple that were upvoted. Um, as you can tell, I'm still having voice issues, but um, I've got one for Dr. Connaughton. Um, it said, "How are peer reviewers selected? Is there a specific pool of reviewers, and uh, is there a criteria? What?" And I, I know NIH has got a program as they search for new reviewers. Is there anything you can share on that with our audience? Yes. Um, so um, the pool of reviewers would encompass um, professors, associate professors, and assistant professors um, with uh, appropriate scientific expertise to evaluate uh, the impact of an application. So. Uh, there are standing um, 
study sections that have members that have been appointed for four to six years. And then um, there are, temp there are um, members that are appointed to special emphasis panels that are convened uh, to review applications submitted to a specific funding opportunity announcement, such as an RFA or a PAR. Um, the SRO uh, in particular will, will evaluate the science in the application and make the determination of what expertise is needed to review that, uh, that application. Um, we have uh, a database um, called uh, Impact2 that lists uh, uh, essentially everyone that submitted a grant to the NIH uh, is listed in that uh, database. Um, we use information that we've gleaned from attending uh, scientific meetings and conferences um, and our own knowledge of uh, individual fields. Um, there is uh, both CSR and NIDDK um, have a, uh, uh, a link where you can, uh, a, new, a new reviewer can apply to um, participate on a CSR study section, or um, you can go to the NIDDK review website and um, upload uh, information about you, your biosketch, and um, you might be selected for an NIDDK panel or a CSR panel, depending on the needs of that panel um, and the applications being reviewed. I hope that helps. So Cynthia, can I just jump in on one question? One question says, is the grants management specialist also a scientist? Um, can I just say, heck no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we leave the science to the scientists, the, the grants management specialist and the grants management officer usually are very administrative. Now, I'm sure there are some people that have come from maybe a scientific background that have become specialists, but generally we leave the science to the scientists, that's the SROs and the POs, and we let them answer those questions. If you ever have a question about the money side of the house, then give us a call. That's us. Great, thanks. Um, I think we could take one more question if it's uh, if it's a pretty quick response. So I'm going to give this one to uh, Dr. Rankin, um, and I and it's really just a clarification, I think. Uh, but um, is it a well? You already answered. Is it appropriate to contact several POs? But can you can you give um, uh, some guidance to our audience about when is the best time? to contact you uh, as a program officer? What stage are they in there in the development of their research? Um, as early as possible. I, you know, I like to talk to people at a minimum 12 weeks before they are planning to submit an application. And when I set up a call for pre-application consult or whatever you want to call it, I, I will ask you, <laughs> for a draft set of specific aims. So I get a sense of your project and science, your bio sketch. And if, you know, if it's a career development award, I, I, I do ask you know, what you had in mind in terms of career development activities. But for just a, an R1, it's those two pieces. So the project should be farther, far enough along that you've got a draft set of specific aims. Doesn't have to be perfect, pristine, um, but um, certainly give us enough information to help you you know, again, make a determination as to whether it would be within our mission interests um, at, at the IC that we're working at. And then the biosketch um, helps me understand who you are. And the earlier you contact me, <laughs> the easier it is for me to give you actionable advice with respect to the application and, and, um, and the proposal. Certainly two weeks before a deadline, it's really almost impossible. <laughs> for me to provide such such advice. Um, so as early as, as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Um, all right, well, that is um, uh, going to wrap up the formal part of the presentation. And so I thank all of our uh, presenters today and all of you for joining us.